There are few more cherished beliefs in modern medicine than the idea that saturated fat will clog your arteries and kill you, or that statins will save you from this fate. These two beliefs are so ingrained in medicine that they're beyond questioning. The problem is that science that cannot be questioned is not science. It's dogma, and dogma can be dangerous. This is the evidence pyramid, also known as the research hierarchy. It ranks study designs by their risk of bias. Study designs most likely to be biased are down the bottom. The poorest level of evidence within this hierarchy is that of expert opinion. In essence, expert opinion is the reliance on eminent individuals or organisations to deign what they consider to be the truth. And another phrase for this is eminence-based medicine, basically relying on the credentials rather than facts, taking whatever we've been told on faith. Eminence-based medicine is more about the messenger than the message. This is a tweet from a very well-credentialed cardiologist, and when he and I had differing views on a topic, he resorted to an appeal to authority, a case of simply, trust me, I'm an expert, without any scientific substantiation. The problem is, blind faith in any authority can lead us astray. And by authority, I also include bodies and institutions who often publish official guidelines and commentaries. And it's easier than you think to be misled by eminence-based medicine, even for doctors. I received this email from a family doctor with more than 30 years clinical experience. And even she was having trouble deciphering the science on statins. Her medical group was pushing her to increase her judicious prescribing of statins. Basically, they wanted every single one of her diabetic patients to take a statin, irrespective of their cholesterol level. So she decided to look at the science. And she came across this, an expert commentary claiming that taken, taking statins would help her diabetic patients to live longer, that it would afford them a mortality benefit. And this doctor asked for my opinion as to whether this expert opinion was reliable. And I was immediately curious because I've extensively reviewed the literature on statins and I wasn't aware of any research that proved a significant mortality benefit. So I went to the evidence cited within this expert commentary and they cited six studies that supported this notion that taking a statin would help a diabetic patient live longer. Now, three of these six references were cited on the basis that they specifically proved this effect. The problem was none of these three studies actually reached statistical significance. That is, these findings could be explained by random chance, hardly reliable evidence. However, things got even worse when I looked at the remaining three studies. These didn't even look at mortality. Now, it's obvious that a study can only make findings about something which it actually looks at. Now, it beggars belief that experts would make mistakes with all six of their supporting citations. Literally, none of the studies they cited in support of the mortality claim in actually fact did so. Charitably speaking, they must have been more confused than a chameleon in a bucket of Skittles. And dietary guidelines, too, are another form of expert evidence. Except with the backing of governments, they can wield immense influence. The problem is, our dietary guidelines were born of bad science and still have not recovered. The origins of our modern dietary guidelines date back to 1977, with a US Select Committee meeting on nutrition, which was convened by this man you see here, Senator McGovern.
And while ostensibly this committee was set up to evaluate the science, when you mix science with politics, you get politics. And indeed, that's what we got. Robert Olson, a leading scientist of the day, pleaded with Senator McGovern to allow for a complete review of the science. But this is Senator Olson cajoling, pleading. I, I argue that senators don't have the luxury that a research scientist has of waiting until every last shred of uh, evidence is in. Basically, McGovern said to Olson, uh, you know, we'd like to, but we don't have, we're politicians, we don't do science. And McGovern's refusal to allow a proper scientific process, I believe was pivotal in the end result. You see, even in 1977, there were more than 70 randomised controlled trials against the notion of restricting dietary saturated fat. And despite this evidence, Failure of the scientific process, driven by a political agenda, resulted in the production of dietary goals for the United States, which recommended the avoidance of saturated fat. And these dietary goals evolved into dietary guidelines under the watchful eye of this lady, the vegetarian-leaning Louise Light though again, not without significant political influence. Louise recounts how initially her team recommended grain consumption be limited to two to three serves daily. And after review by her masters in the office of the Secretary of Agriculture, this was inexplicably increased to six to 11 serves per day, perhaps to help reduce a massive grain surplus brought about by government policies. And this recommendation, you can see, made its way into the food pyramid down in the bottom right. Furthermore, Louise recounts that Congress legislated to compel all of the feeding programs administered by the USDA, including school, breakfast and lunch, daycare programs, so on and so forth, to meet this expanded grain requirement. In other words, this ridiculous quota was mandated by law. How's that for influence? And while we've done away with the food pyramid, the plate which replaced it still decries saturated fat. One not so subtle shift in recent times has been an increasing hostility to red meat, again, without a valid scientific basis. The fact is those who made our current dietary guidelines as with Senator McGovern, have resisted calls for a scientific process. As a part of the public consultation process during the development of our guidelines, this submission was made. It requested that a comprehensive evaluation of the science into carbs and fat be conducted. And yet this request was dismissed out of hand with this non sequitur claiming there was insufficient evidence to institute a review of the evidence. To me, this looks like obstruction of what was meant to be a scientific process. Of course, this obstruction didn't extend to every submission. This one, which looks suspiciously like it was from industry, received a positive response. The committee seeming to agree with the notion of encouraging the consumption of junk food. The problem is, reviews within without a systematic process to evaluate the science, risk selective referencing of the literature, cherry picking, if you will. This is incredibly common amongst expert commentaries and guidelines. In the 1960s, for example, there were four trials that specifically examined the effect of modifying the diet in the prevention of heart disease. And only one, the Oslo study, found any suggestion of benefit from restricting saturated fat. With this net review here, the small circles represent subsequent review papers to these four interventional studies, and the connectors showing which of these four studies they referenced. You can see the outlier study, shown by the big blue circle, was by far the most referenced paper. Concerningly, it was often the only 
referenced paper by a good number of these review papers. This is cherry picking in action. We also see that cholesterol lowering trials with favourable outcomes are cited six times more often than those with unfavourable outcomes. In effect, a single paper in favour of lowering cholesterol will have the same degree of citation influence as six papers finding no benefit. This results in a huge distortion in our perception of scientific findings. At the end of the day, expert opinion, including dietary guidelines, is at the very bottom of the evidence hierarchy. Now, dragging ourselves up off the bottom, we get to mechanistic studies. Mechanistic studies, in the purest sense, occupy themselves with understanding the underlying reactions and mechanisms, often at a molecular level, that lead to disease. Let's take a look at, at an example of the misuse of mechanistic research to propagate the myth that red meat causes bowel cancer. You may remember this 2015 World Health Organization report, which claimed that red meat causes bowel cancer. It led to a worldwide media frenzy. This conclusion, however, was based on completely unsound science. This is one of the mechanistic studies cited in this paper as providing experimental evidence that red meat causes bowel cancer. It is a study on rats which were injected with a chemical called azoxymethane and then subsequently fed either white meat or blood sausage. Now, azoxymethane is a toxic chemical specifically used to induce bowel cancer in animals. That's what it does. The fact is, by being injected with azoxymethane, the rats in this study were likely to develop bowel cancer no matter what diet they were on. Except none of the rats in this study actually did develop bowel cancer. None. None in the white meat group, none in the blood sausage group. There were precancerous lesions, that is to say, not cancer, but even these were evenly distributed between the two groups. Could there have been a better study to prove that red meat doesn't cause bowel cancer? And yet the authors of this World Health Organization report cited this as evidence that red meat causes cancer. You can't even make this up. After you've processed that, ask yourself, could this have been an honest mistake? And for what it's worth, I consider animal research to be at the level of mechanistic evidence. The fact is, there are significant physiological differences between animals and humans, which severely limits the extrapolation of any findings. Take thalidomide, a drug unleashed on pregnant mothers to treat morning sickness. It has devastating consequences on unborn humans. And yet, this effect is not seen in rats. Clearly, findings in animal studies do not always translate to humans. A point that didn't seem to bother Nikolai Anakov, who posited that dietary cholesterol causes atherosclerosis in humans, on the basis of research where he fed rabbits cholesterol dissolved in vegetable oil. Now, this is not to say that all animal research should be discounted. For example, in this study, 44 rats were given an experimental cholesterol-lowering drug. You're looking at the sole survivor, the other 43 having died. Now, if this research had been taken as a warning and followed up by more specialised human research, it might have presented this cholesterol-lowering drug, treparanol, from ever being brought to market, a move which would have saved thousands of people from needless suffering, including this 10-year-old boy who you can see with a permanent cataract. Mm. 